Oh, we are live. All right. Uh, we're live, everyone. Do, do you struggle with anxiety? Do you ever use food to cope with overwhelming feelings? Have you ever wondered if what you eat could affect your feelings, your mood, anxiety? Well, guess what? This episode is for you. Stick around as I chat with my friend, Katie McKenna, certified nutritionist, licensed mental health counselor, uh, and anxiety and nutrition expert. Mm -hmm. You're going to learn how to redefine anxiety. You're going to learn some solid neurohacking strategies to minimize your feelings of anxiety and gain emotional agility. Uh, welcome, welcome, everyone, to episode 57 of Keto Chat Live. If you're joining us, I'd love you to share just type in the comments where you're joining us from. I always love to see where our viewers are coming from. So just type in where you're from there. So uh, welcome to the show. I'm your host, Carol Freeman. I have a master's in nutrition and clinical health psychology. I'm also a board certified keto nutrition specialist. And I specialize in helping women 40 plus follow a keto diet for sustainable weight loss. We've got to give you a little medical disclaimer here to keep the lawyers happy. Uh, this show is meant for educational entertainment purposes only. It is not meant to be medical advice nor intended to diagnose, prevent, treat, or cure any condition whatsoever. If you have any conditions, concerns, questions related to your specific medical uh, condition needs, then please seek out the proper authorities, uh, your personal health care professional. And so join me in welcoming to the show... I didn't tell her I was going to do this, but um, I want to bring up this banner. My computer did a re uh, an update last night, so it's so slow. Okay, here we go. Uh, help me welcome to the show. Round of applause for Katie McKenna. Uh, I know Katie from Baxter University, so she was a predecessor in the same program that I was in several years ahead of me, and so she was kind of a mentor to me through that program that I was in. And um, let's see. So I have a I have a bio that I've pulled from your website, but also tweaked a little bit for the show here. So uh, yeah, Katie McKenna is a graduate of Bastyr University, and she's here to talk about her unique approach to anxiety and healthy eating. And she is a psychotherapist with a master's degree in nutrition. Her full-time Private practice offers a unique, unique integrative approach that fosters change on all levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. For over a decade, Katie has helped people redefine anxiety and learn neurohacking techniques that give you emotional agility, aka ninja stress management skills. Who doesn't want some ninja stress management skills? Coupled with functional nutrition, so that you can overcome anxiety and emotional eating tendencies. She integrates the latest research on body mind connection, belief systems and the neurosystem or nervous system to guide people in clearing negative subconscious beliefs and reactive trauma response. So welcome Katie to the show. Hi, Carol. I'm happy to be here. Welcome everyone who's watching. And those of you watching the replay as well, welcome to the show. Go ahead and type in the comments where, you're joining us from this is an interactive the reason i do this live because i want to chat with you all here so um so katie where are you joining us from uh, i am in seattle excellent yeah it's still snow up there we actually have five inches on the ground right now and more maybe to come we we're we've it's white <laughs> five inches oh my gosh i haven't got an update lately so oh my gosh yeah, I, I, I think those in the city have have much, much less, if, if any, but I'm okay. a little bit north. So okay. mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a friend that lives in Everett, and I think it was last week she was telling me when it first hit that the power was out and yeah. the power lines were down. So she yeah, was actually trapped at home. <laughs> yeah, same here. <laughs> well, I, I lived in Seattle area for 27 years. And when I first moved there in 93, you got, we got snow like every four years and yeah. it was just a dusting, maybe an inch or two, shut the city down, no school. Uh, and then by the time I left there two years ago, snow every single year, several times a year and many, many inches a lot of the time too. So it's, it's changed quite a bit yeah. over the years. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what's your favorite thing to do on a snow day? Well, you know, what's funny now with the, there's been so much change post the pandemic where healthcare has really turned to telehealth, at least for mm -hmm. me, I've remained in telehealth. So uh, like snow days don't exist anymore, as far <laughs> as, uh, like being off school or off work. Um, in fact, if it was no power, that would have mm. maybe been a day yeah. off work, but we actually have some hills around and we've got some really cute neighborhood kids that love to play. So I've definitely gone sledding with my neighbors. 
Oh, how fun. Yeah. How fun. I do, I, I'll admit, I do miss the snow days down here since I moved to Phoenix, Arizona. Um, but we just got to go a couple hours north up to Flagstaff and there's snow up yeah. there. So mm -hmm. I can, I can have it if I want to. <laughs> That's kind of the best. <laughs> yeah. Well, Katie, just for, um, you know, people that don't know you, if you share a little bit, how, you know, how did you get into nutrition? How did you decide on the the uh, the degree at Bastier. So Katie and I have the same degree. It's a double master's in nutrition and psychology. And so, you know, what was your path that led you to pursue that? Sure. Well, uh, you know, the story can always be long or short, um, but the medium length version is when I was actually uh, about 19, I was having a lot of stomach issues and I had like an endoscopy and all this stuff. And, and the doctors told me that I needed to like avoid tomato sauce and go on antacids. And I started, uh, I mean, the internet was still kind of new. I started researching and um, finding out there was like other ways to approach healing. And that's where I started to, well, the, the other half of it is um, I come from a family of nurses. And so I was going to nursing school and, and having some real um, disharmony with mm. that process. And so uh, I started doing some research and I discovered Bastier and they had an undergrad program in nutrition. And so that's actually where I started. I went to Bastier in 2001 to do my undergrad in nutrition. And uh, that just opened my mind in so many ways to hear about what food can really do for our bodies and how food can be medicine. And then from there, I went to work <clears throat> for a Native American uh, community out here in, in Washington on a diabetes grant. And my time with the Quinault, which was just so, so memorable, I spent a number of years out there. Uh, people, my job was to teach diabetes related information, but people would come in with so much other hardships going on, um, traumas, uh, abuse, things that they wanted to talk about. And I was supposed to be talking about diabetes. And so I realized I just really didn't have the professional tools. I had like the human empathy for sitting with people, but I wanted the tools. So that's where I decided to go back to Bastyr because I, I had such a good experience in undergrad. And by then Bastyr had that dual program of master's in nutrition and a master's in psychology. So that's why I went to Bastyr and, and the, like the beginning of my story. Mm. Oh, I love it. And that, so recently they changed the name of the uh, program. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, it, cause now it's a master's of arts in psychology and a master of science and nutrition. Is that, do you know mm -hmm. how they changed it or, you know, I, I I actually haven't kept track. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they have they have changed it. And, you know, when you and I were there, that program was still relatively mm -hmm. new. Um, so it doesn't surprise me that it's it's gone through some changes. Um, and, and, you know, what, it, what actually like the next piece that's interesting is having that combination of nutrition and psychology. Um, it, it really landed me when I graduated. I was looking for work and I found work at an eating disorder clinic. And that was such a great place to get to really practice both. Mm -hmm. And then through the years of working so much in the field of eating disorders, as I started to learn, like, what is even the root causes there? A lot of root causes have to do with with trauma, depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so that's how my career has like the river has changed over time of what I, I specialize in. And, and anxiety is just such a prominent thing that all of us can relate to that. It's um, it's a big focus of my work now. Mm. Yeah, I was going to ask that about, you know, what is anxiety? Why does it seem to be so prevalent now? Is it partly that it is more common or is it just that we have a name for it? I was actually thinking before we went live here about how mm -hmm. when I was growing up, when I was a child, the, the word anxiety wasn't thrown around, but my mom would always say label, oh, you're anxious. Mm -hmm. And she used it to mean like I was excited and eager for something to happen. And I know there's an overlap, right? Of like, we often think of anxiety as something that's very uncomfortable and uh, something we don't want to experience, whereas the eager and excited for something could be something uh, that we want to experience. So um, we share a little bit more about, you know, what is anxiety? What's happening in the body? Um, sure. and I have too many questions there. So I'll, we'll start there. Well, that's quite all right. Yeah, it, it's true. I mean, I was a child of the, I, you know, I was in the 
grew up in the 70s and the 80s. And, you know, we might say somebody was nerve had nerves or mm. I have nerves. Um, anxious is is a really kind of uh, originally a clinical word that is now so commonplace. Uh, I think that both is true. This idea of it, it, do we have it more or not? Or do we just have better language for it? Is there more acceptance around mental health? So people talk about this stuff more. Um, these are all really good questions. I do think that in general, um, people, well, I like to think of like our, you know, historically, maybe even our ancient ancestors might have had stronger family connections, maybe stronger connections to uh, the, the land and nature, some of these things that like help us ground and like discharge stress. And in general, I, I really do think many people are really isolated. And I mean, that's even true. Just because you're single doesn't mean married people are less isolated because sometimes you can be really lonely even in a family. Um, so that isolation, I think, really does breed some of the anxieties that we have. Um, and when you flip through the DSM, the diagnostic criteria for anxiety, you know, I think a, a lot of people would qualify. And, and my, you know, where I'm really arriving at after now being in the field for 10 plus years is them trying to like kind of turn things upside down. I think the way we pathologize human emotions and say, act like it's a problem to be fixed or diagnosed or labeled or, um, I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with taking medication, but that that's that's also not always the um, only answer. So um, part of my message is really getting back to understanding that we are, human beings are feeling people. And if we're not um, supported or trained or educated in how to be with our emotions, then they can become so overwhelming and we start to avoid them and um, distract ourselves. We move into addiction or numbness, um, things that like also relate to like uh, disordered food choices, but all that, then that disconnection just breeds even more anxiety in the body because we start to get really scared of kind of like our, our shadow selves. Mm. Oh, it's so true. Um, I know for me growing up that, you know, parents didn't learn how to have feelings or accept them or experience them. And so as a parent, you want to help your children feel okay and good. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the message was uh, if you were sad or crying be quiet or I'll give you something to cry about. Uh, or if you were too excited, it was calm down, sit down, be quiet. So 100%. all either side of the, the emotion spectrum was like, we were, nope, nope, quiet, calm, sit down and be quiet and don't have any feelings or emotions. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I will use my brother as an example. Um, I come from family in the Midwest that I th think still have a lot of that attitude. And he's got two sweet little girls, but he's always saying, just be normal. And what uh, he's saying is don't have emotions. Mm -hmm. Like, don't be sad. Don't be mad. I mean, not not entirely, but like, don't don't do it in big ways. Just be solid. And that's that's a lot of the way I was raised, too. And and you're right about like the. Uh, the excited feelings, you know, I think about uh, extreme sports people, like what somebody else might call anxiety in the body. That's the feelings they love and go for when they're like about to do their parachutes and squirrel suits and all of that. So just depends on how we're wired. Yeah. Yeah. So talk more about like, what is anxiety? What's going on in the body? What are those feelings that can feel overwhelming for some people? Well, you know, I mean, some of this is a good question because we have some research and understanding about feelings, but to be honest, it's, it's pretty limited. Uh, you know, we know things like oxytocin is a feel good chemical. We know cortisol is a, is a stress chemical. Uh, we have endorphins released to help us have like energy, um, whether or not something feels good or bad. Uh, but there's a lot we don't know about emotions and emotions really do feel differently to different people's bodies. Um, you know, there's people who study a lot of biofeedback and are looking at emotions as possibly even being um, something kind of akin to like radio waves, like a, a pulse of information that moves through us. That is, you know, like Wi-Fi is invisible, but yet it's real and we can measure it. Um, and that maybe emotions are something along that line. So specifically with anxiety, um, a lot of times what people mean is their heart's pounding, Thoughts are racing. Uh, I mean, when, when anxiety starts to move into panic, you can even get like numbness in your face or numbness in your arms, which then 
you know, makes the panic accelerate because that sounds like symptoms of a heart attack. Um, but I'll, I, I would say, I, I think maybe you can add to this, uh, anxiety for a lot of people is not, is a very unpleasant feeling in the body. And they're just kind of want to distract or numb or avoid it because it feels bad. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, I can see we've got some people watching live, but can you just let us know that you can hear us by giving us a comment? Uh, I want to make sure that we're coming through loud and clear. If you could say, just give me a yes or a thumbs up in the, in the comment section. So I know that you can actually hear us. I can see people popping in and leaving. So I just want to make sure that on the other side that we're, we're, we're coming through. So um, that would help us out a lot if you would give us a thumbs up if you can hear us. All right. So um Let's see. I've got all these questions I wanted to ask you too. So let's talk about now. Okay. So we, we kind of talked about how as children, most of us have been trained to kind of numb out or avoid feelings. We haven't learned how to accept or feel them. So, you know, what are some of the beginning steps that you have that you work with your clients in managing anxiety or overcoming it or what are the, what, you know, how do you, how do you um, talk about that? Is it, is it, trying to get rid of anxiety? Is it minimizing it? Is it accepting it? Like what, what's your goal when you're helping people manage it? Well, you know, it's, it's really interesting how, um, it's more than semantics. Like our words around anxiety can be really revealing as far as, um, whether or not you say overcome or heal, um, my perspective and where I'm like this working theory that I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of arriving at is that Anxiety is worsened the more we try to avoid it. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of, I think, reverse psychology that's required to essentially lean in. You know, lean in's a, a pretty popular topic um, in other forms of therapy, like in marriage therapy and things like that, about how to, how to lean together, how to move towards what's uncomfortable. And so I think that's the, the essence of what we really need to learn to do. Um, my thoughts around anxiety is that there's sometimes other things, other feelings underneath it. And it could be a feelings, beliefs, sometimes things that are just like partially subconscious or that, that we don't really want to go there. And so um, when we are in the habit of, I would say like numbing, avoiding, disconnecting, distracting, we can then get even more lost in our heads. We can get lost in addiction, even if it's minor addictions, um, like our phones or shopping or food or alcohol, bigger ones. Um, so the work really is starting to understand that we are emotional beings um, and, you know, we're not really given an owner's manual for that. So like seeking out support so that you can start to understand your whole emotional palette. Um, you know, we're pretty quick to like be okay with feeling happy, but we're in general, we're not okay with the, the more uncomfortable ones. So to be able to tolerate what feels like discomfort, and that's a mix of emotional literacy, like having having words and distinctions for things just more than like sad and mad. Um, I even like to think, you know, like grief versus sorrow versus longing to, it, it sounds poetic, but to really kind of draw out the subtleties in these words and to start to pair it with also the sensations we're feeling um, because that helps us connect in our bodies. Uh, so am I feeling jittery? Am I feeling empty? Am I feeling, um, butterflies is a common one or my a pit in my stomach you know we've, we've got a lot of words for body sensations like the weight of the world on my shoulders or i feel like i got punched in the gut so in truth we, we've got a lot of like kind of common phrases that actually you take a minute to think about it and it really does help to start to identify so this process of going towards naming things being able to witness what's going on so we've, we've got emotional literacy that's the naming things the the witnessing which is a bit of um, I mean, my favorite way to think about it is the weatherman. Um, the weatherman can observe what's going on and report about it, but they don't have to be out there in the rain getting sopping wet. And so sometimes with our emotions, if we get too sucked into it, it's like we're in the rainstorm. We want to have like that healthy amount of distance where we're like, okay, I am sad. I am upset, but that's not all of who I am. Um, you know, because that's, that's part of it is emotions can be so overwhelming. We get lost in it. And then from there, you can also start to learn how to shift your moods. And that some has things to do with food, diet, exercise, posture, uh, the stories we tell, our belief systems, our worldview. Um, so that's that's the, the top level version of, of 
taking people through the process. And, and we kind of um, a lot of times narrow it down to three things, emotional literacy, uh, observer awareness, and emotional agility mm. as, as a way to make peace with what's going on in the body. I was just having a, imagining how fun it might be for somebody to actually like step into the weather reporter role, just the way of like, Hey folks, right now we've got a lot of storming going on inside my belly right now. And, yeah. and the, the rain is coming down and the lightning and all that. So back to you in the studio, Katie. <laughs> <That's perfect. laughs> right. Well, because I mean, emotions are, are moving forces. Um, now emotions certainly can get stuck. And then that's a, that's a whole nother level of like, um, intervention and how to work with yourself. But when, when emotion shows up, it is like the weather. Am I feeling sunny? Am I feeling stormy? Is it rainy, misty, foggy? Um, and, and the ability to like be with it without needing to change it, that alone is kind of enough to usually, gen it also will start to like move on just like the weather does. Like the snow's not going to be here forever. Hmm. And I remember kind of a mindfulness concept in school where they talked about that if you're experiencing depression, it's often because you're focused on the past and regret of things that have happened or you've done. And then if you tend towards anxiety or more future focused and worried about possible things that could happen, mm -hmm. uh, what do you, how do, how, does that fit within your paradigm or? Yeah, you know, I, I've heard that said quite a bit. And I think that makes sense that in, in, in general, depression is, uh, you know, with a lot of focus on the past and, and anxiety can be a lot of focus on the future. And, and either way, the part of the solution and the intervention there is what does it mean to find presence um, and to, to be here now in this exact moment? Um, and that's where things like breath work, meditation, um, can, can help us find that, that present moment. And, and, you know, our current culture doesn't really teach us a lot about that either. So there's a lot to learn. Yeah. And there, the, mm -hmm. I'd never really been somebody who experienced anxiety as a primary emotion until that fateful car accident in 2014. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and I, so I, for people who don't know, I was rear-ended by a distracted driver. It was a pretty traumatic accident. I ended up bedridden for the next three months and I developed a lot of, uh, you know, PTSD like um, anxiety around driving and being in a car. And even to this day, which were like, oh my gosh, what's the math? How long has it been? Almost uh, eight years, eight years since, um, almost nine since mm -hmm. that accident. Um, I still have so much anxiety in the car and, you know, certain situations like brake lights or what my brain coded is you're gonna die if you see brake lights. Yeah. And I remember the therapist that I had, um, wonderful, wonderful lady, like helped so much. And, th but there was part of it like, okay, part of it's true what she was telling me, but part of it was like, no, that's not true. Okay, so um, she would tell me that the feelings that you're experiencing are because you're worried about what might happen. And uh, which could be partly true. And she says, that's not actually happening right now, though. You're, what you're experiencing is the worry of something in the future. And I was like, well, partly true, right? So my brain just coded for this, this experience. Wow. And it's, it's terrified that I'm going to die. And so it's, and the feelings I was having were happening in the moment, right? Like when, it, when I still have that. So I was like, okay, I believe part of what you're saying. And I think that maybe it's more because she was trying to get me to talk myself out of it, right? Like mm -hmm. in my brain, like logically go like, well, that's not happening. However, it's like, but the experience and the feelings I'm having are very real in, in the moment. So um, how do you, I don't know what the question there, um, you know, what do you, what do you think about that idea that like, what's you're you're only worried about the future. So it's not real. Like it's, it felt dismissive of me of like, no, but I'm actually having these feelings right now, even though right. I'm not dying and we're not in a car accident right now, it still brings up real feelings and physical feelings and uh, emotions. Well, you know, uh, I appreciate that you're using a personal example because that, that sometimes makes it easier to talk about this kind of stuff. Otherwise it just sounds like, like theory and intellectual. Uh, you know, to me, it sounds like what, you, what you're really having a, was a trauma response. I don't think I would have mm. even labeled it anxiety. Mm. Um, and trauma is a hard thing to understand um, because it can be sometimes big and obvious. Like, you know, you were in a car accident, 
But sometimes like negative childhood experiences, if that was your normal, you don't really know to label that trauma until much later. But in, in your case, you know, it seems that our brain, when something dangerous happens, it kind of is unable to, um, like memory is not very succinct or accurate and things can get, well, I, I think of them that they don't get filed away as in like that happened in the past. And so for your brain, when it sees brake lights, it's, it, it really can be almost like it puts you back into that same thing is happening again. The accident's happening now. That's my understanding of, of essentially kind of like a flashback and that kind of thing is your brain gets flooded with this is happening now. So it is very real. And this is also why like traditional talk therapy really falls short because you can talk about it till you're blue in the face and a little talking is probably good, but really there's all this other kind of concepts and interventions about how to work with your nervous system, your subconscious mind, the, the part of our brain that, um, the amygdala that that like registers fear and all of that. So it, I would say it's got to be a lot more body based of working with uh, those sensations that were happening to you and, and sometimes still happen to you. You can't talk yourself out of it. Right. OK. That's yeah. And I yeah, because that's what I do now is like, you're OK, you're all right. Like just some soothing self-talk, but it's still really prevalent almost nine years later. Um, so let's talk about that. What are some of the techniques that you use with your clients in, you know, helping them well, again, manage, it, soothe? Yeah. I mean, you're right that like that part about, okay, I am fine. I am safe. Helping yourself know that you're safe. I mean, that, that's an important tool to be able to do. And, you know, it's, it's, it works somewhat, but like kind of what you're saying, you're like, why, why is it still happening for me? Um, that's, that's frustrating. It might even be kind of painful. It's yucky. I mean, to say the least. Uh, I mean, my favorite intervention, honestly, is things related to EMDR. Uh, there's beginning research out there that things like EMDR can help our nervous system reprogram to the present moment. So the, the way I think of, of trauma, and, and this does tie into anxiety, because it's all connected, is Ideally, at the end of the day, the brain when we're sleeping is able to say, these are the things that happened and it's over. Um, when we have continuous kind of flashbacks or emotions that don't really go away, it's almost like the brain saying like, I think this is still happening. I think this is still happening. And what we wanna be able to do is help the brain realize, even if it was terrible, it is over. But again, we can't say that to the brain. There's this process of being kind of in a meditative state being in the sensations while staying really present. And one of the things they talk about in, um, oh, what's that other, uh, I'm blanking on the other form of therapy that's really body-based, um, but like orienting to the room, that, that kind of things that help your brain go, okay, nope, this is, you know, December 2nd, 2022, I'm safe in my body. But it's, it's not just the words, it's about like, finding and resourcing safety inside and helping it to kind of like spread out. It, and it's got to be kind of felt is I guess what I'm saying. You know, if you just say I'm fine, I'm safe, but you don't feel that way, it's going to fall short. Mm. One of the tools that my therapist gave me, um, she had one of those cush balls. Do you like, um, it was like a spiky little like soft ball. And I think she worked a lot with children, but it was really effective actually. So I would keep it, it, it and I knew from my own training that if I, even though it was so uncomfortable to be in a car, to drive myself, and it was especially uncomfortable when somebody else was driving, yeah. I knew that if I avoided driving, it would just close my world down and it would make it worse. And so I forced myself as soon as I was able to drive again to get out there and drive as uncomfortable as it was. And then the the, the cush ball was like a text texture sensation thing that would bring me, instead of like being kind of a you know, in the emotion or worry, like right. touch, touching that little different textured thing would kind of bring me into that, like into the present moment and almost a distraction a little bit, but also it was like a, a mindfulness centering thing. So that was a tool in the very beginning that really helped me overcome the extreme version of what I experienced in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. There's even things 
like shaking the hands, uh, rubbing, you know, kind of like playing like you're running your feet or like rubbing your feet on the floor can be really kind of grounding, presencing things. There's some interesting stuff with like tapping as well. And even some, um, you know, there's a lot of beginning um, research coming around, like they're calling it polyvagal. Uh, calming exercises that again have to do with the eyes. So there's some connection also with how our eyes are um, working when we're dreaming on, and also when we are impacted by something traumatic that is kind of like a shortcut to the nervous system. And, and honestly, there's a lot of theories out there, but we don't really know. There's not a mm. conclusive answer on, on why that's work, but it's similar to EMDR or something called brain spotting. Um, there's some different things out there to explore. Well, and perhaps those, um, I don't know what they're called, but they're kind of like pop-it things. Like it's a little plastic tray that you pop the little buttons in and out. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. Yeah. Oh, okay. They're like, because fidget spinners were popular for a while. What was just like something to kind of like get you in this present moment. It's kind of a texture thing or like yeah. an active thing. And then they also have all different shapes of, um, it's like a, a soft plastic, again, different shapes. And it's like a little, um, it's kind of like a button, but you can pop it in and out. Huh. I, don't, I don't know what they're called. Somebody somebody who was watching this later, let us know what those are called. <laughs> um, I think it's the same concept. They didn't have them nine years ago, but they have them now. And I, I see them as like a anxiety um, type of tool that just kind of helps somebody come back into the present moment of doing something textural and, and physical activity a little bit, you know, a thumb yeah. <laughs> physical right. activity. Well, then, you know, I think also some of these ideas about like what an intervention is called for, it kind of depends because when somebody's moving more towards the extreme where things are, are pretty heightened and nearing panic or in panic, the interventions there are going to be different than if it's just that medium level. Mm -hmm. With that medium level, which I think a lot of people can relate to, the idea of being able to kind of close your eyes and actually just be like, okay, what's happening in my body? What am I noticing? And, and honestly, even inviting yourself to like go towards what's uncomfortable that, you know, people often talk about like relaxing on vacation or something. They're like, oh, I, I unwound and unwound again and unwound again. So like, we have some concepts around like layers of being able to go deeper. And mm -hmm. so there's some really interesting things that happen when we give ourselves this gift of our own attention mm -hmm. by saying, all right, I'm really feeling this pit in my belly or I'm really feeling my heart racing and like let's say your anxiety on a scale of one to ten if you're if you're at a five this is a good practice to be like all right i'm gonna just like go sit with this sensation in my heart and and without any agenda i'm just going to be really curious about what is happening now mm -hmm. um and oddly when we start to pay attention it, it starts to shift. Like sometimes, I mean, sometimes it might feel a little worse. It might feel a little better. You might get some interesting kind of connect the dots ideas of like, oh, you know, it's really bothering me X, Y, Z. And so uh, awareness, and, and this kind of stems from a lot of like Buddhist psychology also that awareness itself does a lot of healing. And that's why this whole idea of move towards lean in is part of the medicine. Hmm. I'm reminded too of another example related to food that came up on a, uh, a group call with some of my clients the other day, we, we were talking about the, um, like a lot of similarities that we had in food scarcity growing up and yeah. how, you know, weight loss and dieting can bring that up again. And, um, you know, so for example, um, you know, maybe you lived in a household where there just wasn't a lot of food readily available all the time. Um, mm -hmm or some deeper trauma, I experienced something where a babysitter uh, was neglecting us and not making uh, food for us because she was making out with her boyfriend, you know, and right. we were too young to be able to make anything for ourselves. And um, so these awarenesses of, of, you know, food deprivation and being on a diet and not, you know, calorie restriction and things like that are things that I brought into my practice. So I don't actually like to give my clients a calorie restriction. Cause I know for me personally, that was always a trigger was that, okay, I, I only get 1200 calories today, but I've eaten 1150. I only have 50 calories left. Suddenly I was just, oh, I was 
food obsessed. I was hungry. I was Absolutely. like, I, I can't get enough. And so it's a big influence of why for my clients, I don't give them a calorie limit. Um, we, we focus on other things and then focus on feeling full and satisfied and getting your nutrient needs met rather than re restriction. And so, um, which is a feeling of anxiety, right? That comes up when you're like running out of food and you're not going to have enough food. Um, the other commonality that we talked about in our group was that how, um, when there's free food, and this also has to do, we're mm -hmm. recording this in December and the holidays are upon us and there's going to be a lot of events, right? Where there's a buffet of food and there's free food. And that also we talked about was a trigger for if it's free, you want to get as much as possible of it and, and yeah. managing that. So what, uh, what tips do you have for people around when those type of things come up? Yeah, those are all really good points and things I, I talk about quite a bit with people. Um, the food scarcity thing from, from diet mentality that comes around it. And that's maybe if you start dieting as a teenager or an adult, that could happen. But like um, part of what you're saying with childhood, if you've got a mom that's dieting mm -hmm. and is then restricting the child's food, that can create a lot of scarcity. Um, it also creates a lot of sneaking um, it can lead to, to, to binging behaviors, that kind of thing. So the food scarcity and the, the, that anxiety of, am I going to get enough often causes us to um, like overcompensate. And so we eat too much because it's like, I, I've got to get it now. And uh, so much to be said about the power of understanding that just like our body's wired about emotions, we are wired um, to know when we're hungry and when we're full. So it's not as simple as that because if you got all the right amount of calories from orange juice, you're actually still going to get hunger cues because you need protein and fiber and things like that to make yourself feel full. But the idea of helping people get empowered with understanding their body's cues about um, what hunger and fullness feel like. And one of my favorite phrases to say with people is um, I feed my body when I'm hungry, which also implies if I'm not hungry, then I wait because that, that's the other half of what a lot of us are working with. Like you said, the holidays, we're just inundated with temptation and cravings and, you know, also um, emotional or boredom cues to, to want to eat. But this alignment of I feed my body when I'm hungry helps dissipate the food scarcity because it's like, yes, if my body's hungry, I, I'm going to feed it. Um, I think is just a, a really important mantra to repeat when somebody's in that process of, of changing their relationship to food. I feed my body when I'm hungry. Mm. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Yeah. And, and for uh, one of the common things that seems to work for a lot of my clients too is that having plenty of go to foods on hand in different situations, right? So, one of our peer support coaches, Rita, shares often about how when she travels, she will take, you know, different meat sticks and, uh, yeah. you know, different things like that that she knows she enjoys. And, um, and, she's been doing this for, you know, two and a half years now. And she says she's still like overpacks when she goes because she, that calms her mind that it's okay. I have plenty. Uh, mm -hmm. If I'm hungry, I will always have something to be able to go to. And yeah. she comes on with most of what she took, but that gives her that, that reassurance that she's not going to have to, you know, eat something that she knows won't make her feel very well because right. she's always got plenty with her. Yeah. And it's accessible. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so that that's that's important. There, there's a lot of other nuances there about how other people feel about you know you bringing snacks, especially or to the holidays. Um, you know, there's a lot of expectation sometimes of eat grandma's favorite lasagna, and it gets complicated. There's a lot of emotions that come up related to food, and you know that's I, I think about half of the work that I do with with clients. I know that, but I, I really talk about the anxiety and the, the trauma work, but so much of it is how we relate to food in our bodies and, and navigate the emotional realms. And, and honestly, other people's emotions about food, because, you know, there's this idea that if you're coming home for the holidays, you're supposed to eat X, Y, and Z, or this is what you ate last year. Why are you not mm. eating it this year? Mm. Oh, and I know for me that walking into my mom's house, because it was mm. always like about food, like suddenly I'm hungry. As soon as I go to mom's, like I want, and I want X, Y, and Z because that's what I always ate when I went there. Yeah. I found myself going to the cupboard and the fridge is like, okay, you don't need that right now. You're okay. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. Uh -huh. Let's talk about the other side of this as well, because 
I, I know that for my cohort of the, the program that we did, which was the nutrition and psychology, that we all felt really passionate. One of the reasons we wanted both those degrees is because we felt like we need to be able to have psychological tools to help us make healthy choices. And also we felt very strongly that our food choices influence our feelings and emotions and how well our brain and the rest of our body work. And it was interesting because I don't need to get into too much of the, like the, the people that were running the program didn't really get that because they'd been trained on either psychology or nutrition. And there wasn't a lot of, of unity or maybe a ton of research in, in both this going both ways. Right. So, uh, right. uh so t- let's talk about, so definitely what's going on in our mind can influence our food choices, which mm-hmm. we've, we've just been talking about. So let's talk about the other side of that, about what, what is our food? How does our food influence anxiety and other emotions and, Yeah, you know, I mean, that is such a fun topic. And it's true. I I feel like you and I, when when we went to school, we were kind of in the frontier of starting to even be with the research and in education about the fact that that exists, that food affects your mood. Um, And so there's even so much more that's like come out in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, For me personally, I am not... um, like a really kind of like the, the biochemist supplement focus of things, because I do often so often work with like disordered eating and eating disorders that getting down to that nitty gritty part can get um, triggering for people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, whether or not to say like somebody specifically needs uh, more glutamine or more B vitamins, like that's not really my specialty. I come at it more from, um, what are the stories that we have around food? So for example, uh, if you have decided that, I don't know, ice cream is bad for you either because dairy is bad for you or because it's too high fat or too sugary, and then you eat it and you feel guilty, how's that affecting your mood? Um, If you feel too full and you've decided fullness is bad and that now you're in shame or disgust mood wise about food um, is, is one of like the ways I look at it. There are some real specifics that I think are generally accepted about the power of um, omega-3 fats. Having the right amount of healthy fats in our diet is a big component of mood regulation. And even I think like uh, to to be able to like make all those like feel good chemicals, we really do need the right amount of omega-3s. The funny thing is, you know, more and more with research, like when they start to say have more omega-3s, we're starting to find out you can't just straight supplement that it's got to be the right proportion with the sixes and the nines. And the same thing, for example, with B vitamins or zinc, you got to make sure you have copper. So it helps really to, for me, just push people back towards a whole foods diet, lots of colors, lots of vegetables, lots of fiber, plenty of protein. Um, because then we know they're getting, you know, not just the vitamin C from the supplement, but if they're having an orange, they're getting all the bioflavonoids and the other parts that, that come with it so that we can digest it and absorb it. Um, so, uh, personally, I think supplements are really useful in certain ways, but when it comes to mood regulation, I, I really think about it more about understanding our, um, stories around food, that the stories we've, we've kind of told ourselves and, the way that uh, for individuals to get really specific about how do I feel when I eat this way? That's um, often one of the mindfulness questions that I give people when they are working to change their relationship with food is to ask, am I hungry? Um, If I eat this, how will I feel? And how will I feel either later today or tomorrow based on how I've eaten this? So they can start to understand for them how foods make them feel. And I'll I'll include too, while we're at it, just because I don't know about you, but I think we could both talk about this till the cows come home. Um, when we're dealing with things like food sensitivities, food allergies, gastrointestinal issues, there's a lot to kind of decipher too about like, oh, am I going to have um, stomach pains or am I going to have some kind of like need to run to the bathroom if I eat this? So there's a lot of checking in about food that way and how that also affects our mood. And, you know, I have a, a client that was just recently saying, um, she has to be so careful about what she eats because of her intestinal issues. She doesn't, um, if she's in public and has to run to the bathroom, that gives her so much anxiety. And so her food choices have gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. because She's really scared about having intestinal issues out in public and not being able to find a bathroom. So there's just so many ways that the, the food affects our moods. Mm. I'll add in a, a 
a couple of things that I see the work mm-hmm. that I do with my clients too. So a uh, protein, and then I'm talking about keto. I wanted to yeah. say both of them. So I remember <laughs> I forgot to bring a pen into my podcast studio. So I oh, normally like, we'll take yeah. notes. So I'm like, uh, so I'm like, here's my own trick of, so I remember both of them. So uh, protein um, and, you know, in general, we're finding that we've been told to avoid protein for quite a while. And for my ladies, especially because like typically protein rich foods are stereotypical man foods. And so then women try to eat, you know, a salad when they're trying to lose weight and it's very low protein. And so protein ends up being uh, so essential. And I usually do baby steps to get my, my ladies to eat adequate protein, right? So we start out at 80 grams a day, which is still not enough for most of them. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is so much protein. I'm like, wait till we double that. (laughs) And Uh so, you know, one gram per lean of body mass, lean body mass weight, uh, pound, let's see, one gram of protein per pound of lean body mass is kind of a starting place. And um, so proteins are made of amino acids. And amino acids actually are necessary for us to make all of our neurochemicals in our brain. And so if we're under eating protein, our body just, our brain can't make all of the neurochemicals to make our brain work correctly. So this is what, you know, one very important piece is getting adequate protein. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about that is that we were talking earlier about how food restrictions makes us hungrier for some people. And so for protein, we get to have this free for all, eat as much protein as you want. You want to get at least this much. And so that's one of the things that's really cool about the work that I get to do is that I get to give them less, like protein ends up being a free food for you and uh, eating yeah. more of it ends up being a uh, important part of getting better. Um, so this is, you know, one reason why, and then protein rich foods, especially the whole foods version of those is also tends to be the most nutrient rich. So it's going to be rich in minerals and other nutrients. So like Katie was talking about where you get that synergy of the food in nature comes with all the things that we need to digest it, assimilate it, and uh, make everything in our body that we need to make from those nutrients. Um, And then the other part then, keto specifically is actually really, really powerful for minimizing feelings of anxiety. And so we have research that shows in, 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 Mice or rats, I don't know which one they did, those cute little rodents, where um, it increases GABA on the brain. So GABA is a neurotransmitter that is the basically the opposite of anxiety feeling. So it's the, it's the cool, it's a chill, it's all good, man. It's kind of that kind of chemical in our brain. And so the clients that I'm working with, at introduction of keto and typically, you know, within a couple of months, uh, they will just notice that like, wow, I'm just so much more stress tolerant. My mood is so much more even keel, uh, like things that typically would have just set me off the rails. Like it's like, it's not that big of a deal anymore. And so this is, uh, you know, a researched um, effect that ketosis has on the brain and the body. And additionally, uh, typically people around them will also begin to comment, right? So maybe the husband or spouse or the children are like, you're just so much more calm and mellow now. Like, you know, you're easier to get along with. And so this is the effects of, you know, ketosis on on the body and the brain. And likely there are like a thousand different mechanisms that are all happening that help promote that Mm -hmm. sense of calm and peace and well-being. Um, Additionally, my clients all report too that, especially the way that I teach how to do keto with all the psychological stuff we've been talking about, is that it removes their food obsession. And because they're getting adequate nutrients, they're getting proper satiety from proteins and fats and the right amount of vegetables. And they're also even keel blood sugar. So one of the things that makes us food obsessed is when our blood sugar is going up and down. And so they get that all of all those many different benefits of and it gives them so much more peace. So not only the neurochemical peace that they get from the GABA, but they just a lot of that anxiety over like, will I get enough? I'm constantly hungry and all that just really kind of calms down and helps them have just improved quality of life overall. So I'd throw in, throw in those ways that I know that specifically keto, since this is a keto chat (laughs) show, uh, really helps with, with anxiety management. Well, you know, uh, I am not as educated on keto, so I super love what you're sharing. And I had a, a client, we were doing a bit of family therapy. She's an adult woman and we were uh, bringing in her mother. Um, so like a, two people, one was about 30, one was about 60 and doing family therapy. And through the course of time, the person in her 60s actually went keto mm-hmm. and experienced a 
I mean, I'm going to say a drastic change in her personality. It was beautiful. And the then the therapy work really shifted because her, um, it's just things really changed. She was less triggered, less stressed, more um, emotionally tolerant. Uh, it, and so I just saw that firsthand uh, over the summer I was working with those two. Mm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I like to I like to think that, well, keto isn't doing something to our brain, especially the way that I teach it. It's more moving back into eating the way that we've eaten for most of human existence. So while it's called keto now, and that's the popular term, it actually is just much more in alignment with the foods that have been available for 200,000 years. Right. And I, I, I talk about it being we're, we're drawing a line in the sand and we're, well, some people say like, oh, it's restrictive and that's going to make people more food obsessed. It's we're removing all the foods. So the highly processed uh, sugar and carby foods that, mm -hmm. you know, pretty much that's the one thing that all nutrition experts agree. Those just aren't healthy for us. Mm -hmm. Like they're not doing us any favors. Um, we're moving, removing those. We're removing also fruits and vegetables that have been highly selectively bred over the last 40, 50 years that are really high in sugar, yeah. um, but low in nutrients. So nobody's, you know, claiming that they're the, the red delicious, not the red delicious, what's like the gala apple or the honey crisp. Nobody's claiming that that has 40% more vitamin C than previous versions of apples. They're just really delicious and very sugary. So, mm -hmm. um, so we're just drawing a line in the sand and we're eating foods that are, you know, the way that they've grown for a long time, they're nutrient rich and we're avoiding the ones that are going to, uh, trigger cravings and, uh, you know, blood sugar roller coaster type of things too. So, uh, that's my little so I don't think I, so I feel, I feel like I'm just teaching people. We're just going back ancestral to ancestral eating. Uh, yes, it's called keto right now, but it's really not the goal. The goal isn't to be in ketosis forever and, you know, check your ketones and all that kind of stuff. It's about quality of life, yeah. uh, peace and, and moving away from anxiety actually in, in multiple different ways. So. And, and like you said, finding what works. Um, so when somebody um, comes to you and is following that keto process is, and, and is, experiencing many things, including the gabapentin and that, that kind of that calming effect and, and no longer being in that food scarcity place. Like once that you find what works for you, it's no longer like, Oh, I'm following a fad or a diet or what some, anybody else is telling me it's, this is what, this is what nourishes me. Bo body, mind, and spirit. Mm. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yes. So what kind of work are you doing now? I know we we're talking about you're doing some classes and retreats and workshops. Like what, um, what, what different formats are available? If people want some more help with the therapy side of anxiety. Well, I'm in a kind of creative spot. We're trying a few different things. Uh, pre pandemic, I had just been starting to do some <clears throat> retreats and workshops and in some ways, because I think the, the, the power and the wisdom that comes in groups uh, is a really great thing to offer people. Um, and we really enjoy those. And by we, uh, so I've got my nutrition and mental health practice, but my husband is a, a, a somatic executive coach and he's been working in the field. Uh, he's been coaching for maybe 15 or 18 years. So he, he's been doing this quite a long time. Um, we started sharing clients on occasion by just cross referrals and just finding that like they were so well supported, the kind of changes that they accelerated through was super fun and useful and real. And so we started specifically working together. Um, and so uh, some things got put on hold during the pandemic and we're just now bringing them back. What we've been doing lately is like once a month free classes on Zoom. Um, in some ways for me, just to get the practice of learning the technology and, and, and doing groups online. Um, and we're, we don't actually have anything set in stone yet if we're gonna do in-person work. What's coming in January is probably gonna be every other Wednesdays at 10.30, where it's gonna be kind of like um, roving topics. Uh, so we might start off with it in general, how to redefine anxiety, like that idea of leaning in towards your sensations. But we're gonna let each group kind of lead to the next topic, like bridge from one to the next. Um, but literally that's that's just in the works right now is uh, the the every other Wednesday starting in January. Uh, we do have to have a class happening this afternoon. Um, okay. But what's your, what's the website that 
people can find out more information. I'll make a banner and put it on the screen here. Oh, sure. Uh, we call ourselves The Anxiety Experts. So it's theanxietyexperts.com. Uh, the point here is we, we do talk about anxiety quite a lot, but when we mean The Anxiety Experts is we're really educating people to be the experts in their own bodies. Mm. Okay. Anxiety, the anxiety experts.com. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you're listening or watching to this in the future, then uh, you can check it out. And there may be some more offerings there on their website for classes and workshops and maybe some virtual or in-person retreats. Well, we'll have a whole mix. I think it's, it's fun for me um, professionally over time to just create diversity in the kind of work I do. So, and, and that's a mix of sometimes one-on-one -on -one and sometimes groups. Um, and it's just, this is what I love to do. So we, we keep mixing it up and the offer keeps changing and um, the world's just changed so much now with our ability to also um, go larger with our audiences. Mm. You know, our Department of Health licenses require us if we're working as a, a therapist or nutritionist to only work in the states that we're licensed. But um, in the field of coaching, you've got ways to, there, there's not that limitation. And so there's just, there's a lot of changes afoot. Yeah. The world changed a lot in a lot of ways in the last couple of years. Yeah. Yep. yeah. All right. Well, Katie, was there anything else you were hoping I would ask about or that you'd like to share as we wrap this up? Well, I mean, I think if we just, if I talk about what's really most important to me is this idea that um, our bodies are designed really intelligently. Uh, you know, our immune system, even if you just got a, a scrape on your finger, there's the subconscious mind that runs the immune system knows how to heal your hand. You don't have to think heal, heal, heal. Um, and we also have that. I like to think of, we do have like a, a mental health immune system. And part of what really accesses that is awareness. Um, when we become aware of I'm hurt or I'm sad or I, I'm, I'm wistful, you know, getting into that literacy piece. So understanding that we're wired to have emotions, that they bring us information about our lives. Uh, to me, I think about it as kind of like GPS, you know? Um, I mean, just because something hurts doesn't mean we, we shouldn't go there, but it is really good mapping our sonar for following what's right for us. And, and in fact, um, I've got a, a client who's trying to decide whether or not to take a job. And so we're really like working on articulating what do I want? Because you can do all the pros and cons lists, but being able to feel yourself on the inside is that little nuanced parts about um, how our emotions really do help guide us. And so the more we can learn to be with the things that are uncomfortable, including anxiety, it just, it brings a lot more rich information that helps us guide our own lives. And it's, it's really powerful to tap into these sensations that are part of us and they're there for a reason. Love it. I, I love that reframe of not only like the pros and the cons, because sometimes that doesn't make it clear, but like, what do you want? What do you really want your life to look like? Yeah. 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 Well, wonderful. Thank you, Katie, for being here today. Um, this special, special episode. And I, we, I'll be live again next week, Thursday, whatever the date is. I don't know. I should have had that uh, calendar up for you all. But uh, if you liked what you heard today and you'd like to get some more personalized support with keto, if you, perhaps anxiety is overwhelming for you and you want to get help with the nutrition side of things, um, I'm here for that. Uh, if you're, let's see. So I'm going to put my website up here. Sound like I've never done this before. <laughs> Um, so I do work very closely with my clients in getting keto. Like I've talked with Katie today about how it's personalized for you. There's no one size fits all approach and it's about what works for you for long term and helping you bring that quality of life. And so I work very, very closely with my clients. I only open up 10 client spots per month. And therefore I work with people by application to make sure it's the best fit on both sides. So visit my website, ketocarol.com. Carol has an E on the end. It's the very fancy French spelling of Carol. If you'd like to see, you can read my story there too. I do talk about, I mentioned in this episode of the car accident that I was in. Um, you can read my story on my website if you just want to learn more. And so go to ketocarol.com and thank you again to Katie for being here and um, 
we always close the show by saying, uh, if you enjoyed this, share it with somebody else. And remember, if you help us grow the show, we'll help you shrink. And <laughs> thank you for being here, Katie. I'm going to put your, your website up here one more time here, the, anx the anxietyexperts.com. Thank you for being here, Katie. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Girl. Thank you, everyone, for listening, watching. We'll see you next time. Bye, Bye. now. Bye.